do this. It's kind of got like peacock hair going on. Hmm. Oh, that'll do. That'll do. Forget about it. Forget about it. Hello everyone and welcome back to a new How To In 10 episode. Today's episode is going to be a little bit of a mix up between a how to and a how I got into the fashion industry because I want to go through different ways that obviously you can try and enter the fashion industry, all the different types of jobs that there are available and also to talk about how I progressed into my fashion career and the steps I took to get where I am and to get the qualifications that I've got. I must admit I've been meaning to do this video for many many years because it's I would say my most highly requested video. I've been asked profusely to talk about my PhD, my qualifications, etc. So I thought I'd kind of do two in one for this video. I can kind of tell my story, hopefully inspire any of you that are thinking of doing a PhD or further education, and then also talk about the other careers that are out there in the industry. I'm going to try and go through this quite quickly, but also quite thoroughly, because I know that I may get questions on a few things if I skip them. Going back to the very beginning, I always knew that my passion was for a fashion career. I was obsessed with clothing from a young age. I would go shopping on the weekends with my mum and I was just obsessed with the latest kind of trend pieces and trend colours that were out there and just was always trying to kind of dress as cool as possible. It didn't always happen, but it was kind of in my mind that I wanted to really dress myself up in any way that I could. So when I had the chance to choose my GCSEs, I did textiles and I did a double art GCSE. Then I went on to college and for anyone in the US, um, college for us is at the age of 17 to 18 and then you go on to university. I did art, textiles, English language and media studies. Again, all very creative subjects. I retained the English language A level mainly just to progress my knowledge of English I suppose, so I was a bit more in tune with how to write professionally I suppose. I was somewhat good at drawing and artistic subjects and I felt, in honesty, I feel those four as a package were a really really good option for me. Um, I got a question the other day from someone saying that like how did I manage to convince my mum and my parents to let me do a much more creative degree because I realise a lot of people are pressured to do the more academic subjects and what I said then was that the fashion industry is one of the biggest industries in the whole world. There are so many careers in it, it isn't just the idea of trying to be a fashion designer and potentially not making it and then be like, well what do I do now? There are so many careers in the fashion industry from branding, marketing, PR, HR, design, manufacture, I mean there's just a, such a huge multitude of jobs. Um, so actually I feel I feel the whole stance of, oh, you know, fashion topic as a degree is a little bit archaic now. And actually the number of universities that do fashion degrees is just enormous. So it just shows just how popular they actually are. So in the second year you always drop a subject. So I dropped media. But yeah, I got two A's and B, which meant that I got enough points to go on to the University of Manchester and do the design management for fashion retailing course. Manchester University for me was the best years ever. The most incredible, prestigious red brick university. It was also in my nearest city because I'm from Wigan and Manchester is literally half an hour away on the train. So it suited me fine. It meant that I could go live this life away from my parents whilst still kind of having them at arm's reach if I needed to go back. Turned out I barely ever really went back apart from my kind of summers um, or Christmas holidays. But otherwise it was just the freedom that I wanted and it just ended up being the most kind of defining years of my life I think overall. Like I met my best friends, I met Alex there, I very much grew into the person I am now, I gained all my confidence from there. So um, first of all if you are thinking of going to university and living in at home or living out and going living at your university then I would so highly recommend take the plunge, move out of home and just go and get some independence because it's the best years of my entire life. Okay, I mean these years are fantastic too but they were just so much fun and I would give anything to go back even just for one day to those years and relive them again. The courses have slightly changed in name and they kind of got really modernised when I was still working there. So I think my course was changed to fashion retailing, but there's also a fashion branding course, a fashion marketing course, and there is another one as well, I can't remember, has it been that long since I left? 
Oh my gosh. Um, anyway, so I thought I'd bring this and show you. This was my dissertation, my third year dissertation. What marketing communication techniques does the high street retailer Topshop adopt in order to market its products to its target consumers? So marketing was always the thing that I was most interested in. Oh, you know, I really put so much effort into this. Like I made like pages for each section. And it, they all had a lovely like photo page thing to start and yeah, it was all it was all about Topshop and what um, marketing methods they use to kind of pull in their consumers. That's always been my highest interest. Now, during the time I was at university, I also did some placements. I just really wanted to progress my knowledge of the more working environment and working in offices or with the right people. And again, I so, so recommend doing this if you're able to just get yourself a three week placement or to a year long placement. A lot of universities will offer the chance to go out on your third year and work it in the industry and then come back for your fourth year. I wanted to do that. In honesty, I couldn't find a placement that was right for me. I must admit at the time, I wish that I was given a little bit more help with that. I just didn't know where to look, who to speak to. Sometimes it can be about who you know, but at the same time, I really think that networking and getting your name out there and speaking to people does massively help and just emailing, especially now, social media back then wasn't really well, in fact, it wasn't really a thing. Instagram only started in 2010 and I was at uni in 2007. So this will have been 2000, end of 2008 that I was looking for a placement. And so there wasn't anywhere that you could go to Instagram and stalk who works at the marketing department of such a brand or, you know, there wasn't that way of speaking to people in the industry as it is now. So if you're looking now, you're in a much better position than I was back then. But instead I did a couple of internships. I did a couple of months in London working with Roxy Quicksilver because that's who I worked for in Manchester. That was my part-time job. I worked in the Roxy Quicksilver store. So I managed to get myself a placement over in their London headquarters and learned all about the marketing of Roxy and that was absolutely awesome. I learned so much from that. It also really throws you in at the deep end, like having to ring people, um, organise things, you know, it may sound strange but so many people have, especially now because we're always on our phones and texting, most people hate picking up the phone and I detested it. I was like, please don't make me ring them. I had such a fear of it. And that's something you definitely have to get over. And it's just like, you need to ring them right now. Like stop panicking and just pick up the phone. And you're like, oh my God. But just think just little skills like that. You learn on placements and you kind of, you know, brush off these things that you feared before. Anyway, so I worked at Roxy Quicksilver in their more like marketing department. I also worked at Marks and Spencer's and this was my first internship. And I worked in the buying department. The best best thing about that placement was that I realised I did not want to go into buying, which is which is great because it just taught me one thing. You never know, I could have gone down a buying route with what I wanted to do and then realised later down the line that that just wasn't what my passion was in. Like I'm very creative and therefore marketing for me works really, really well. I also did a couple of weeks with Henley's in Manchester. Hen I don't think Henley's is now still going, but it's a very like streetwear brand. It totally not my style at all, but it was just a really great opportunity. And again, I learned a lot with the marketing team there. So I did Roxy MNES, I did Henley's. I'm pretty sure I did another. But anyway, my point is try and do as many placements as you can. It's fine if you don't get a year long placement because it was never really a det detriment to me because I also did my own placements learned a lot on those it helped bulk out my cv oh i know what i did i know what i did when i was in uni as well i worked it was like one day a week i worked for a digital marketing agency called return on digital in manchester and again it taught me about a very different side of marketing that i didn't know about i mean they kind of specialize in the digital sector so seo P pcp i always get this wrong p Again, that helped me realise that I preferred the more creative side of marketing, more advertising side than the back end and the digital um, arena. So those were the career aspects. Now, when I finished my degree, there was an opportunity that came up to do a PhD, which I went for. Um, I was so lucky that I ended up getting the chance to do this PhD. Obviously, that was dependent on me getting a first class degree, which I did. So I moved straight into this PhD. And again, it was just the best move I ever made. At the time, if I hadn't got the PhD, my thought process was that I was gonna move down to London and I was going to try and get a job in marketing for a big fashion brand. Like that was my dream. I only said this a few days ago on stories, but my dream was to work for a huge fashion like department store, 
brand like Net-a-Porter, Farfetch, Louis Vieroma, those kind of things like Selfridges. My dream was to work in their marketing department and kind of work my way up to head honcho. That was my aspiration and I think it's always good to aim high, why the hell not? So I ended up doing the PhD and thinking well let's just do this, it's three years, it means I'll just broaden my own education and understanding of this entire industry and then I can then move into a career later and let's just think about that later. First thing I want to say is yes usually you'll have to do a master's before you do a PhD. I'm not overly sure why but for me I was able to move directly into the PhD and it was almost kind of this rumour that was kind of spoken of that if I'd finished after a year with the PhD and decided it wasn't for me then I would have got my master's for a bit just like a one-year thing but for some reason I was able to expand it out to three years. I don't know why that is um, and I feel very lucky that I got a chance to do that because it meant I could cut out one year and I got a PhD at the age of 24. So this was my PhD here that I got in 20, 2014. Blimey. God it feels like so long ago now. It's enormous and I cut this down. I think I got, I had about 120,000 words in here and ended up cutting it down to about 80,000 which was really really difficult. My thesis was the emotional and behavioural implications of mobile commerce design. So I was researching how different people reacted to mobile shopping and how it made them feel and behave the point being was to help instruct retailers as to how to design their mobile channels in order to increase the chances of someone buying or being inspired or wanting to browse more or shop more. That was kind of the key purpose of my thesis was to almost enhance the understanding of retailers as to this brand new mobile platform. I mean now you know, it's moved so, so fast since then, but at the time this sort of research was extremely underdeveloped and it honestly, it was kind of hard for me to do this because no one had written about mobile commerce at the time. So in a way, I was like, right, I want my research to get out there and, you know, talk about it. And I was, I was thrilled that I ended up in the Fashion Marketing and Management Journal in 2013 and I had two of my, uh, two articles published. So if any of you guys are at fashion, doing a fashion uh, uni degree and you can go on Emerald, you will find me, just, I mean, just search for McGrath. There it is. Marketing design elements of mobile fashion retail apps. Um, I'm pretty sure that right after it is my first one. There. <laughs> yeah, the back to back. And then the branding design elements of fashion mobile apps. So that was kind of everything that I was looking at. Anyway, I'm just trying to think of all the questions I've been asked in the past. Like my PhD was three years. I had my own office at the university. It was, I mean, it was awesome. There's a couple of us doing different fashion PhDs and we had, it, it had no light. We were like down in the basement of this beautiful building at, on Sackville Street, the Sackville Street building. Um, and we were down there in this office, but us four girls together were like such a good friends and, you know, we'd go out drinking and it was just like we had this really good rapport. So it, in the office, it was just really, really cool and it was awesome. Am I glad that I did the PhD? Yes, 100%. It only kind of broadened my understanding of marketing and the retail space. That, that kind of knowledge and that skill set, I've been able to obviously move into what I do now in terms of my writing, my understanding, my... Uh, ability to be able to speak to people about marketing techniques and it's also obviously helped with the way that I market myself and brand myself. There's so many ways that I will have used my sort of skills that I learned in the PhD for now. Anyway, so then after I then had the opportunity to apply for a position at the university, I was absolutely over the moon when I had my interview and I, I got the job as a fashion retailing lecturer. At the time I was like, I mean I was, 20, I was 24 at the time and you know I had a classroom sometimes of 120 students that I would teach fashion retailing or fashion marketing. I'd like to think that I had a fantastic rapport with my students. The actual teaching aspect, standing up for two hours and teaching a lecture was a really amazing experience and then at the end of the year when you get like the exam scripts back and you mark in everyone's exam scripts and stuff it's, yeah, it's, it's a really fantastic feeling when they're writing back all the things you've taught them. It's very, very cool. And I'm, honestly, I feel so, so honoured that I got that position. It got to the point where I had my lecturing position and I had my blog. I started my blog during the time I was doing my PhD. And over the next few years, it just grew and grew. I think I just started at the right time 
and was putting out a lot of content and really kind of going for it and I, I was obsessed with it, I loved it so much. So most days I would, you know, I'd work on my blog from like 8am until 3 in the afternoon then I'd write my PhD from 3 till 10 at night and then I'd work on my blog from 10 till 3 in the morning then I'd go to sleep and I'd wake up at 7 and go back into the uni and do it all again. I was very tired at the time but it just really helped me to progress in both. It got to the point where I had to give one up, I had to either pursue the lecturing career and potentially I would have gone on to maybe do another PhD or I would have done some more journal writing and published some books, that sort of thing. In my head I was like, well, you know, you only live once, let's just try the blog and see what happens. So I moved to London, got my first flat in London like five years ago or so. So I left my lecturing career behind and went on to my blog. So that's kind of like my history leading me to my blog. Um, I mean, I've spoken about some of the things that I did in previous how-to videos about how to grow your channel and things. A lot of the things I mentioned in there are what I did, like the consistency, the continuous posting, um, the networking, all of that is, is kind of how I got to here and I think it's just a lot of hard work, a lot of dedication, a lot of sleepless nights, a lot of the time you don't have your evenings, you'll be working because you've got so much that you're trying to do and you're constantly thinking about your brand and how you build things and, and securing your future. So it's, you know, it, take, it takes a lot if you want to go into a career in fashion blogging. You know, it's a full time and then some career if you really, really want to excel and, you know, kind of progress further. Okay, I just wanted to go down quickly and get hold of my book. So if any of you guys are new here and you're watching this video and it's the first time you see me, you may not uh, realise but I wrote a book a couple of years ago now, The New Fashion Rules. Um, and a lot of what I'm about to kind of talk about and speak about is all in this book. I just ran from downstairs so forgive me a second. So I'll be honest, I kind of wrote this book with fashion students and potential fashion students in mind plus those that just adore the fashion industry at whatever age you are. So honestly, whatever age you are, this book is will be fine for you. It isn't written for a younger audience. It's written for adults, but the idea was to really give a lot of information that would be useful if you are doing a fashion course or if you're interested and very inspired by fashion. So there are there is a lot in here about careers and the industry and the history and how it's it's all about how it's changed. It isn't like a fashion design book, it's not a fashion styling book, this isn't going to tell you how to what to wear with your white t-shirt. This is all about the fashion business and the industry and that's the way I wanted it to be because me, my, my degree was in fashion business, it wasn't in fashion design. That's another point to make as well is that when you go and do your degree there are a lot of different degrees out there whether you want to go down a business route or if you want to go down a design route. If you are creative and you adore drawing out different fashion items and you love the idea of having your own fashion collection one day, then fashion design most likely is the best route for you. A fashion school like the CSVPA would be amazing. Cambridge School of Visual Performing Arts is an incredible school if you want to go and learn and hone your skills and move into like a fashion design sector. Or if you're like me and you love the more advertising, marketing, PR side, um, or also buying, merchandising, retailing, that business side of everything, then um, again there are so many different courses that will be suitable for you, it's just about finding the right one and in the right city. I highly recommend Manchester, just going to let you know. Anyway, so yeah, so I wrote this book for that. This wasn't meant to be a plug for the book, I'm just letting you know that more on this subject is in the book and that's why I wrote it. If you want to go down a design route, the chances are you might want to go into pattern cutting, you might want to go into the actual like CAD design of garments where you'll use illustrator but you'll get taught all of that and you'll learn how to draw out different drawing methods and vectors on a computer in order to create garments. Even go into actual fabric supplying and manufacture if that's what if you love fabrics and you want to move into that kind of side or of course you can go into fashion the fashion design team whether you want to be like a Stella McCartney or a Karl Lagerfeld designing the actual huge collections or whether you want to be an assistant, um, I mean there's so many people that are underneath the designer that are helping with the entire creation um, of a clothing collection. Or you can go down the business route like I said. There's so many different pathways within the fashion business. You could go down the fashion marketing route and go into PR or advertising or to sit in the marketing team of say 
Prada and work out who your next model face is going to be, where you want to put your advertisements, are you going to do TV advertising this year, are you going to do magazine advertising, etc. All those questions and all of those creative ideas will be kind of discussed by the marketing team. Where are you going to spend your budgets for the year? The PR team is more the public relations side, so they are the people who are kind of the middlemen between the brand and the consumer, or the brand and the media. That's often who I speak to when I work with different brands. I'll speak with their PR team who will send me their new products, they'll ensure that I'm having a good time with that brand, I'm enjoying their products, they'll organise different projects, all for the point of promoting the brand. You could go into the buying team. Well, you'll first of all buy designs from most most manufacturers will have their own in-house design team. So that is also another route. So whereas you may wanna work for Gucci in-house, you may find that in fact you work for a manufacturer in-house and you are their designer. And then retailers will come to you and say, we want like 10 dresses a season. What can your design team create for us? A lot of the more fast fashion retailers will use this method and will quite often just buy apparel that is being made by that manufacturer. A retailer like, for example, Boohoo can come along and say, yeah, we wanna buy those trousers, that dress, and this t-shirt, for example. And that is the job of the Boohoo buyer. So you have the head buyer, you've got the assistant buyer. Like, for example, at Marks and Spencers, when I was um, working with the buying team, they had the head buyer, but they also had the assistant buyers, and quite often they will be the ones who go away and visit these faraway places and gather inspiration for new design styles and new fabrics. The designers will often go too, this is something that designers often do as well, um, just to get loads of inspiration for new colours and new styles. But the buyers will often go away and try and find incredible fabric suppliers that they can use then for their next collections. So the buyer is the one that finds and sources new materials, new fabrics, new incredible fabric suppliers that they can then use on their future collections, whether they're designed in-house by the manufacturer or designed in-house by their own design team. Quite a lot of retailers will also do both. They'll have their own in-house design team and they'll have a design team they work with at the manufacturers as well. <sighs> The buyers are also in charge of when the samples come in from the manufacturer, they will do all the fits. They'll get a model in who's like the perfect size 10 and they'll fit everything to her, make sure everything's perfect, send back amendments to the manufacturers. The manufacturers will remake that garment, send it back again. If that retailer is happy with it, they'll often gold seal it. And that is the one that they say, yep, yeah, go ahead, make us 10,000 of that blazer, for example. And then inside the headquarters of these retailers, you'll find stock after stock after stock of these samples, gold seal samples of everything that's coming in for the next season, the last season, the season after that. Everything is very kind of meticulously planned. Then you've also got the fashion merchandisers as well. The merchandisers are the ones who decide how many of a certain garment you're buying for each store. So for example, like Selfridges, you've got four different stores and it's like, well, how many of that Gucci jacket do we want in that Selfridges? How many do we want to put in Birmingham? How many do we want to put in London? How many do we put in Manchester? Do we even buy that blazer for Manchester because maybe the audience isn't right there? Do we maybe buy those shoes for London but not for Birmingham? Those are the kind of, just some of the very simple questions that the merchandisers will ask. And bear in mind as well that you can work for an agency or you can work for the in-house retailer. So whilst you could work for Marks and Spencers on their PR team or marketing team, quite a lot of brands also have an external PR team. Uh, for example, Carla Otto, there is KCD, um, the communication store, just a number of like very famous PR agencies who will work with that brand um, to help with their events organising, to help with their send outs, just their overall media and press. But then I suppose you've also got things like model bookers, the people that book models for the shoots. You've got fashion photographers, if you want to go down a slightly different fashion creative route. You've got the fashion photographer's assistants. You have events organising for fashion events. There are, there are so many different jobs. I mean, I suppose one of the primary ones now is social media managers, people that handle the social media channels for different retailers because it's such a massive part of their marketing spend. And also dealing with people like me, with bloggers and influencers and um, people that are there to promote certain products. I'm going to cut it here, guys, because this is far, far over. This is meant to be a how to intend, but I realise this is a much more in-depth topic. So I hope you don't mind for this occasion this being a little bit longer. 
hopefully it's been quite interesting. I must admit when I did my degree, no one told me of the plethora of jobs and how to get them when I was doing my degree and I had no real idea. So hopefully this has been a little bit more eye-opening and inspiring. Like I said, there's loads more in my book as well if you do want to have a little peek and a read of that. I'll leave links down below of where you can get the book. Anyway, but I hope that's also answered a lot of questions about my educational background and things I did before because you have been asking so much. So I really hope that um, that's cleared a few things up. But like I said, leave any other questions down below in the comments. I'll be answering pretty much every single one if I can. And I hope it's been somewhat insightful, you know, and thanks so much for being here, guys. If you are brand new here and it's the first time you've seen me, it would be so awesome if you could click the subscribe button just so that you can come along with my videos again. So that if you click off the video, you're not going to lose me forever. But thank you so much for being here guys. I will see you soon and take care.